Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you all here as we've gathered for this Vesper service uh, in this season of Lent. Um, just in case you weren't here last week, hopefully you got a copy of the uh, order of service tonight. But if not, don't fret. Everything should be on the screen. I think we're, we're good to go uh, with all that on the screen, so you can uh, follow along there. But we will begin uh, tonight with a, a word of, and a prayer of invocation. And then we'll follow this service. Uh, the only thing that may be a little different from last week, for those of you who were here, uh, I'll end my homily and then not really give us any sort of direction and a time uh, for reflection. That's just up to you to do silently or again on the back of your bulletin or if you carry a journal, uh, that kind of thing. We'll have some moments uh, for reflection. And then Nikki will come and lead us in a time of prayer. And then I will uh, dismiss us with a benediction. So uh, let us begin tonight with a word of invocation. So let us pray together. Lord of life and love, help us to worship Thee in the holiness of beauty, that some beauty of holiness may appear in us. Quiet our souls in Thy presence with the stillness of a wise trust. Lift us above dark moods and the shadow of sin, that we may find Thy will for our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Please join me in this time of responsive reading. O oh Lord, let my soul rise up to meet you. And the day rises to meet the sun. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joy for or for joy to the rock of our salvation. I love this hymn. It's 513. What a wonderful truth. Oh, how he loves you, and oh, how he loves me. Let's sing it. Oh, how. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And you labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And, de and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, 
and nations that you do not know you shall run to, r run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for He has glorified you. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that He may have mercy on them. And to your God, for He will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. To believe in God is to believe in the salvation of the world. The paradox of our time is that those who believe in God do not believe in the salvation of the world, and those who believe in the future of the world do not believe in God. Christians believe in the end of the world. They expect the final catastrophe, the punishment of others. Atheists, in their turn, invent doctrines of salvation, try to give a meaning to life, work, the future of humankind, and refuse to believe in God because Christians believe in Him and take no interest in the world. All ignore the true God, He who so loved the world. But which is the more culpable ignorance? To love God is to love the world. To love God passionately is to love the world passionately. To hope in God is to hope for the salvation of the world. God must feel very much alone, for is there anyone besides God who believes in the salvation of the world? God seeks among us sons and daughters who resemble him enough, who love the world enough that he could send them into the world to save it. From In Christian Spirit by Lewis Evely. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, there were more, worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that there were worse offenders than all the offender, uh, others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for, more, more, for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. So the words that we have heard from both Isaiah and from Luke, from Christ himself tonight, are words that revolve around the theme of repentance. And repentance is actually one of the key themes of Lent. And I don't like that. Because I don't know about you, but I don't like to think about repentance. I don't like to tell myself what I do wrong. I don't like to confess to myself the things, those dark skeletons hiding in the back part of the closet in my life. I don't like to confess to myself the things that I think are wrong, the things that I do that are wrong. I don't like to do that. So I sure enough, I sure enough don't want to tell God. I mean, God already knows just as much as I know. But I don't want to tell God. What I've done, then God will know, right? Then I'll know that God knows, right? Because before that, we just sort of suspect that God knows. 
the bad things we do, that God's everywhere. You know, we tell our kids that when, you know, when we're not going to be around, you better behave because Jesus is watching you. We really think that, but it doesn't really become real for us until we say, until we confess, until we repent before God. I don't like that repentance is one of the themes of Lent. And if I were to wager, I don't think you like it a whole lot either. But I think there's one way that we do like to talk about repentance. And maybe it's best sort of illustrated by something that happened to me when I was a kid. Well, it didn't happen to me, but I was there. There was a time when I was growing up, and it had to be before I was in the second grade, because when we lived in the little white house on the road we called Keaton Cutoff. You've probably passed this house, actually, if you've taken the shortcut through Enterprise on the way to the beach, down 167. Once you get outside of Enterprise, there's a little... little crossroads and a little white house that sits kind of off. It's old. I don't think anybody lives in it now. There was a a few grave plots actually on the front yard. We used to joke that it was haunted because one time we saw one of those tornado leaves go through it, right? We thought it was a ghost. But we would sit out by that cemetery and wait for the bus. It was one of those seasons in my life when it was me, all three of my stepbrothers, my stepsister, and my sister, and my mom, and my stepdad all living in a two-bedroom house. And we were waiting on the bus, the four of us boys, all wearing the four same sets of clothes we all rotated during the week. Nobody but the bus riders knew that. And we were waiting for the bus, and my oldest stepbrother, Nicky, did something. When, when you're a kid, it was unforgivable. He said a cuss word. I'm going to tell you all which one he said, because it's so sad to say this one in church. He said, hell. Not only that, he spelled it. I guess to show us his mastery of the profane, right? Here we are, and he said, hell, and then he said, H-E-L-L. And before he got that last L out, my other stepbrother, Jean, who's just a year, and it's Jean, not John. I fought that battle my whole life when I was a kid. Jean, all of a sudden, takes off running up the driveway. Runs up the driveway and bangs on the door. Daddy, daddy, daddy. And here's my stepdad in the same Little shorts he cut off of some khakis he's worn his whole life in the mornings when he's getting ready. Boy, what you want? And he probably said the word that Nikki said. Probably. John, Daddy, Daddy, Nikki said a bad word. Nikki said a cuss word. And by that time, here we all came running up because we thought John was going to get it for banging on the door. And my stepdad said, Boy, did you say that? No, Daddy. He's already crying, you know. But me and Philip, my other stepbrother, we were the expert witnesses. Yes, sir, he did. He said it. My stepdad goes back in the house and comes out with a bottle of Louisiana hot sauce and, and tells Nicky to open his mouth and shakes it four or five good times into his mouth. Nicky's face turns red. He's drooling. He's crying. <laughs> you know, saying he's sorry, saying he's never going to do it again. And, and my stepdad, Ricky, is like, y'all get on now. I hear the bus coming. Get on. Get on back down there. Y'all going to miss that bus. I ain't going to take you to school. And so down the driveway we went, but I swear, I swear, John skipped down the driveway. He had forced Nikki to repent. He had tattled, is what we say. But what he had done was he pointed out Nikki's sin right away. Nikki did something he didn't do, and Nikki had to repent, and John was going to make sure that he repented. That's how I think. We like to think about repentance. When it's not something we do, but when it's something somebody else does, that's when it's bad. I mean, you can hear it. You can hear it in the, in, in the way that Jesus is talking to those people in the 13th chapter of Luke. That very time, some people came talking to him about the Galileans. Now, to be honest with you, we don't know anything else about this. It only happens in Luke's gospel. They told him, said, oh yeah, you remember them Galileans? Herod had them, had them chopped up, mingled their blood with the sacrifice he offered. Do you think, Jesus says, that they got it that bad because they were worse sinners? No. That's what Jesus says, no. But you know, they almost wanted to say yes. Yeah, they got it worse because they were worse sinners than us. Or when we hear Isaiah's words, especially those, those last ones, seek the Lord while he may be found. And then verses 8 and 9, we forget. It's almost like we read it so fast. I did it myself before. Read it so fast, we skip over three words. 
My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. One time I read that and thought, man, who's talking? Then I thought, that sounds like something I'd say to somebody. I'm not like them. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are, oh wait, that's God talking. Not me. God's the one who says that to those of us who ought to seek him. But we don't want to talk about repentance that way. We like it better if there's somebody else who's supposed to repent. We like it better if there's somebody else who's... Wor- when their righteousness catches up with ours, then we'll start talking about repentance. Right? When they are as good as us, then we'll start talking about repentance. Because we want to be like my stepbrother and like me and my others. We want, we want to find somebody else who's cussing and tattle on them. We want to drag them up to the altar on Sunday morning and say, you better confess. You better repent. We want to find those people in our lives who aren't as good as us and say, you better get on the right track and be as good as me. But that's not what repentance is. And then there were those words that Sally read. Those words struck me the first time I had read them. That God must be very much alone. For who else? apart from God, believes in the salvation of the world. I thought that was interesting. That God believes that the world can be saved, but Christians, ah, we've already written some people off the list. We've already thrown some people in the trash can. We don't, uh, those people can't. No, no. I wonder sometimes if God does feel alone. We do that, we go down the list of sins, and we'll repent our, of, of ours. Once all these other ones repent of theirs. So what's the point of repentance, really? If God believes in the salvation of the world, if Christ said it's one and done, I've died for all, I've died for your sins, if we believe in once saved, always saved, or whatever little thing we can put on our bumper stickers, what is the point of repentance? I mean, are we going to be damned to hell if we die before confessing one little sin before our death? What's the point then? Well, I think especially in this season, in Lent, when we talk about repentance, the point of repentance is to remind us of how deep that grace that God gives us really is. How vast that love is. Because every time I can go and, and, and confess my sins and repent to Christ and say, I messed up. Every time I go and say, I did this wrong, I didn't do this. Every time I say, I did, the, I did this when I should not have done that, I didn't do this when I should have done that. Every time I go to him with my failures, every time I go before him and say, I I'm, I'm just can't keep up, I'm not good enough. Every single time, the judgment, the verdict is forgiveness. Every single time, there's the cross. And there's love. Every single time. And I wouldn't be reminded of it. I wouldn't be reminded of it in such a personal, deep, and shocking way if I didn't confess, if I didn't repent of my own faults, failures, and sins.
If you would, please pray with me. Take a moment and pray for the church. Not just this church here in Williams, but the church as a whole. Now pray for those that are your neighbors. And finally, it's time to pray for yourself. Precious Father, hear our prayers and help us to recognize our sins, our failures, our mess-ups, and give us strength to confess and take hold of your grace. And oh, how you love me, how you love everyone. Give us the compassion to love as you love. In your name we pray. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.